In this video we're going to be covering the basics of statistics and we're going to start with describing data in chapter one of our LIND text. We have a lot to cover and it's going to be kind of a fast pace but I'll provide you with some videos of the exercises and some completed exercises in the spreadsheets. I may also provide you some slides that we skip over in the interest of time but I will leave them for you as a form of reference. So let's move on to our learning objectives. Now the learning objectives that I have on these next two slides, which I'm only going to pause on momentarily if you want to read them all, you can pause their video. These objectives are actually the objectives for the first four chapters. You may remember back when we went through the evidence-based management presentation that we talked about how the five steps of the evidence-based management process include formulate a focused question, that's the ask. Search for the base, best available evidence. That's the acquire in step two. And step three is critically appraise the evidence. And that's appraise. Keep that appraise in mind. We'll come back to that in a moment. And then in four, step four is integrate the evidence with your professional expertise and apply it. And then step five of the evidence-based management process is to monitor the outcomes. In other words, assess. So let's go back to step three, critically appraise the evidence. What we want to do is we want to take the statistics and use the statistics to critically appraise the evidence. We have to understand statistics in order to do so though. And as you can see, statistics is one of the tools used to make decisions in business. And we can use the statistical tools to help analyze the data that we have before us. We put these statistical concepts in play in our no normal lives. As a student of business or economics, the basic knowledge and skills to organize, analyze, and transform data and to represent the information are all useful tools in going forward in the business community. And we have different types of statistics. We have what are called descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics are self-explanatory to a certain degree in that we are looking at statistics that describe something. It's a method of organizing, summarizing, and presenting data in a way that's informative. And the example we have on the screen is the United States government reports the population of the United States was 179,323,000 in 1960, and so on down the line. Inferential statistics, however, may be less intuitive. And the inferential statistics, if you take the word infer from that inferential, that's where we get the inferential statistics, is what we're using the statistics to infer on a population or infer about a population based on a sample that we select. And in statistics it's important to recognize that the word population sample have a specific meaning. Population is the entire grouping of a particular observation set that we are looking at. A sample is just a portion of that entire population. Perhaps a graphic representation will help a little bit. So a population is a collection of all possible individuals, objects, or measurements of interest. In this case we have a set of cars. These are all the possible cop population of cars that we have in the body. A sample, however, is just a portion or a part of the population of interest. So we select a sample in this case a sample of six cars from our entire population. And we, you might wonder why would we take a sample instead of studying every member of the population. Well we'll get into that. In the example that we have here we could take a sample or we could take the population and study the entire population because we only have a small population of cars. But in reality most of the time our population of interest is much greater. So when we take a look at the population, we might have a population of every possible car ever made or every possible 2015 year of car. And that would be a little bit more difficult to study the entire body. 
in fact it would be one one of the reasons we choose to sample is because of a prohibitive cost of the census of the entire population in the United States every 10 years we do a population census of all of the members of the citizenry of the United States and that's very expensive to do that another problem with doing a population census or a population study is if that population study happens to be destructive during the analysis think of it as in the form of health care and if we were doing pharmaceutical testing if the test that we did on our drug was destructive in other words we in order to test it we would destroy it and make it unusable and we did that on every possible pill well that's pretty clear that we would lose every possible pill that we have and we would no longer be able to use the pills to treat people so destruction of the item being studied may be required in some cases and in which cases those cases like that we don't want to use the entire population so we take a sample subset of the population and do that it also may be very difficult if not impossible to take a study of the entire population consider that we might do a study of the cholesterol levels of all males from age 35 to 65 in the United States by the time that we went through and did that some of those on the 65 age year year old age would be on the outside of that and they'd no longer be 65 they'd be 66 so we would lose them and we'd have to go back through and scrub our data and we'd also gain new 35 year olds over the course of the time that we are doing to do the study so we also find that when we take a sample of the population as long as it's a representative sample meaning that it's a good example of the population as a whole the representative sample results yield very close to the same results as you would get with the entire population we have different types of variables when we're taking our samples we have qualitative sometimes called attrib attribute variables and those have the characteristic of being non-numeric so we may have different religious affiliations uh, colors flavors of ice cream those are all qualitative they are non-numeric and then we have quantitative quantitative variable and that information is what we do report with new numbers and the quantitative variables have a subset of discrete variables and continuous variables and the discrete variables can only hold an certain values usually it's an integer but there are exceptions to that and we have continuous variables and they can assume any value within a particular range so that might be the weight height uh, could be tire pressure for discrete variables we see that we have bedrooms in a house as an example and you might think to yourself well I can have two and a half baths in a house that I buy that is true but technically it's not half of a bathroom it's just a term that we use to identify when we don't have a shower or a bathtub in that bathroom and for your reference I have here a summary of the types of variables that you have so we have the types of variables here qualitative quantitative and some examples and then the discrete and continuous versions of the or subset of the quantitative variables and then examples of each of those as well when we break down our values we have four different levels of me measurement that when we work with when we're working with our statistics the nominal level that's when we have data that is classified into categories and cannot be arranged in any particular order in other words it could be the flavor of ice cream there really is no relevance although we might have a particular preference but there is no real relevance whether we do strawberry chocolate vanilla or vanilla chocolate strawberry there is no greater than or less than in the flavors of our ice cream the next level is the ordinal level and in that level of data the data is arranged in some order but the differences between the data values cannot be determined or they may be meaningless so we have different flavors one of them was rated as the best flavor another one might be the second best the third best and so on but there really isn't a distinct difference between first and second place 
Homeland Security Advisory System is also another ordinal level in that there is a difference between severe, high, elevated, and low, but the difference between low and elevated is not the same as the difference between elevated and high, and there really isn't a clear or distinct distinction between each of those. We then move up our level of measurement to the internal interval level, and the interval level is it's similar to the ordinal level except that it has the additional property that meaningful amounts of differences between data values can be determined but there is no natural zero point. So an example that we have here is the temperature on the Fahrenheit scale. The difference between 32 degrees and 33 degrees is the same as the difference between 42 and 43 degrees, but there's no natural zero point for our scale. In other words, if we took the zero Fahrenheit degrees, that doesn't mean the absence of heat. If we took the Kelvin scale, however, we would be able to say that the zero point means the absence of heat. And that's a good segue into our ratio level data which is the highest level of data that we work with. And the interval level has an inherent zero starting point and the differences in ratios are meaningful for this level of measurement. So in other words, the difference between the one degree and another degree is the same as the same distance of one degree to another degree at a higher level, for example. Another example could be the discharge values that we did in our pivot table class. Well, the discharge value of zero means that it returned no income to the hospital when they discharged that patient. And the discharge value of $1,000 is twice the discharge value of $500. And it can get a little tricky with the different levels of measurement. In fact, statisticians disagree on some uh, cases whether values are nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. But why would we want to know the level of measurement of a data set? Well, the level of measurement dictates what type of calculations we can be do to summarize and represent the data or present the data. To determine the statistical tests, we have to know which level of data we're working with. For example, let's go back to our ice cream flavors again. And if we had chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla, and we were doing a Likert scale test or survey, and we said, which are which is your favorite ice cream or which is your ranking of ice cream in first, second, and third order, you could say, okay, my favorite is strawberry, then my second favorite is chocolate, then my third favorite is vanilla. Well, if we took chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, and we added those all up and took an average of that, we would find that the average would be two. And if we had chocolate was number two, that wouldn't mean that the average of vanilla and strawberry would be chocolate. And here's a summary of the characteristics for the levels of measurement. And you can pause it if you want to take a look at that a little bit longer. And this concludes our coverage of chapter one of the Lind text.